All right, so it's recording. Uh, so let's start off. Uh, again, uh, five to eight minutes. Uh, do we have all the TAs in the back? Did you see any of people? Look at Mike. Look at Mike. Right here. Mike, you're Okay. Uh, so we're all good. Uh, Angel, do you mind uh, pulling up, uh, wrap it up? Uh, it's from uh, Chappelle Show, so it's the uh, playing off music. So if anyone goes over eight minutes, then we play that up. Wrap that shit up. So we want to make sure that we get through everyone and that you guys are concise. Again, it's not just for like uh, random arbitrary reasons. Everything doesn't match the madness. You want it to be concise just so like when you're talking about your code, uh, sorry, you're talking about your development, uh, you're not going over the limit, um, especially when you're presenting to like employers and stuff. Uh, I think project three or demo day, you guys are going to be at an employer place. You guys are going to be at uh, Dollar Shave Club. Um, and uh, there's going to be other employers there and everything. So presenting to them, this will be a uh, good practice for that. Um, and then that one, you guys should probably like dress up for and everything. This one, you guys can just dress up as developers uh, for the next two projects. Um, but project three and stuff like that, um, that's going to be like a little bit more fancy fancy. All right. Uh, so let's bring up our first group. Who's Brian? All right, so this is all being recorded anyway. So all you guys have to do is uh, bring up your stuff. All right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm missing the button. Can you do that? <laughs> All right, let me the light on the front, maybe. someone want to present it? Oh, who's the person? Who wants to do it? Um, sure. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll just go along as you uh, present. Okay. I'll just... Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we are a team who's Brian um, and um, wanted to introduce you guys to our team. My name is Gary, and this is Joe and Hattie and Brian. Jo uh, Joe and Hattie work primarily with the back end stuff, and Brian and I work uh, primarily with the front end stuff. So uh, I'll uh, start with Joe and I'll show you what he did. Okay, so I worked on the, um, the first API. Uh, which is called Edamam, which is basically just a giant database of recipes. Um, the idea is you put in your ingredients and you search them and it will return recipes that contain all of those ingredients. I'm sorry, by the way, I think another group done something similar. Um, so the, the API was pretty easy to figure out. Uh, all I had to do was um, take every search item and add them to an array and then use each array as the query parameter for the API. So when you click on view recipe, you select the recipe, it appears and shows more info. We also added the original source. As I had a few problems putting the actual full instructions for the recipe on the page. So I found out yesterday that it's a separate API, but with the same company. So that's something we'd like to do in the future. Uh, in the future, we'd also like to add and exclude ingredient items so you can get recipes that don't have certain things in. Um, and then we use the results for the view recipe button on the other page to, as, as the query parameters for the next API, which Hattie's gonna speak about. So I worked uh, primarily on the YouTube API and uh, the Firebase database. So initially with the YouTube API, we wanted to uh, just get instructions, like video instructions on how to, uh, on how to make this specific recipe, but we found that it's hard to get that exact recipe, just uh, searching YouTube with the uh, with uh, that recipe title parameter. So we, we changed it into um, alternative recipes um, and they, uh, they vary depending on, uh, on the recipe title. Um, I also worked, uh, we used Firebase to add favorites to the, uh, add favorite recipes. Initially we wanted to, uh, we wanted to 
um, what do you call it? Like have users log in so each user can save their own recipes. But we found that authentication was a little difficult for this uh, for the MVP. So um, we just made it as as their site favorites. So um, um, after after the search recipes comes up, there's a favorite button. Uh, we stored all the data attributes that are in the view recipe button in the favorite button, and um, it stores the the basic <coughs> information that we need, um, so that when you view the the favorite recipes, it has all the same information as uh, just when you're searching for recipes. So um, I started out more so for the back end of it, um, uh, starting out with the YouTube API. Um, API key, and um, we weren't really sure how we were gonna um, kind of connect it. And we didn't want to know. We weren't sure if we wanted to have the search results come directly from the input, or um, but we ended up uh, deciding on um, referencing um, a value, specifically the name of the recipe as it returns the low recipe API, and then inputting that back to the user API when it goes to the search. So it'll be a little bit more connected. Like the alternative recipe will you know, be the same recipe as it's supposed to be on the main page. Um, and I also work on the, um, the, the social media buttons, the, the, the Facebook share button for the events, and um, as well as the, uh, the instructions page with the info page, um, just to give my uh, CSS uh, 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 stuff there for the next slide. So uh, I can finally answer the question, who's Brian? I'm Brian. <laughs> yeah, he's that cute Filipino guy in the Monday Wednesday class. <laughs> anyway, um, I started off styling the, uh, the front end, um, the traditional way where you uh, have an in input field and you, you enter an input and click enter and all of the results would show up at the bottom, but that didn't really work out. But um, Joe had this great idea where you use a modal and the model was actually a pretty versatile thing. I didn't realize you can style it any way you want, the way you uh, style a regular page. So we started with that. And uh, pretty much, I also uh, did a lot of bug fixes. There was, you know, ours was pretty much really buggy uh, towards the beginning. But then uh, after that, um, everything worked out fine. That's it. That's it. So then, uh, I guess we can have like a minute for Q and A. Oh, I closed it. So, any questions, comments? Um, when you were sharing like uh, the Twitter and Facebook like share button, yeah, is that like automatically like you're logged into Facebook and open? I you're log in. You will still need to log in, obviously, to your Facebook, yeah. uh, but it'll link directly to the recipe that's on the. I think I was sorry, I was just about to say that. I think there was some trouble styling um, the actual Facebook post. Yeah. Um, and the Twitter and Facebook was going through very similar. But these guys fixed it. Uh, they're actually quite different. They fixed it. Everyone was more difficult to find in these days. Yeah. We didn't really know at first if we wanted to link the share buttons to our page. Um, and we just decided it would just be easier to just kind of reference the actual link to the recipe and just have it return back. Any other questions? So Grant, Grant has a question. Yeah, so I was wondering where did you guys find the back? <laughs> <laughs> um, for, the, for the actual the body or the, the recipe images, I assume you mean. Uh, I, was just, I bought them on Shutterstock. <laughs> Shutterstock. Yeah, yeah. Shutterstock. Shutter 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 Edamon. E-D-A-M-A-N. Edamon? 
Like that, edamame without the without the egg. Egg. without the yeah, oh. egg. <laughs> 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 All right, well, thank you guys so much. This is really cool. So I'm blind, but uh, we have our next group up. I don't know if that's like Oh, Thorns? Oh, God, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> you guys are idiots. <laughs> Uh, something more PC, so I don't get in trouble next time. <laughs> That's why I try to tell you them. You have an AKA. <laughs> AKA. That's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> crazy. Does this mic work? Yeah. It does. Yeah, if you guys want to talk into that mic, feel free to. No. I forgot about this. We're this is God. <laughs> yeah, this is the worst. This. <laughs> <laughs> Want. So we want the presentation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's only one screen. Um, on the website. Okay. We created um, a PowerPoint, but I think we're just going to go through the actual project. So my name is Christine Yokoyama. I was project manager of Code Tards, um, aka Erratic Destroyer. Um, Let's see. I, Alicia and I worked on the front end. Adir and Angelo worked on the back end. Uh, so our client, <laughs> our client is, um, he's an architect designer. Um, he does a lot of celebrity homes. Um, he was featured in a couple of things. Uh, so he was actually very specific about how he wanted his page, which made us, you know, like really become some type of guru to make sure that it was very functional and that it actually had um, a good finish. Um, no. uh, so <laughs> my responsibility was um, getting all the files and organizing them, you know, because uh, GitHub was not accepting a lot of the files. They were too big. Uh, we were getting rejected uh, every time we upload the folder. So I had to make them smaller or compress them. Um, I also had to convert the RSS feed from his favorite website, which is Dwell. Uh, they didn't have an API, so they had an RSS feed, which only had an XML. And the XML, we had to convert to JSON so we can, uh, you know, call to it and then populate the page with that. That was a problem we were having. Uh, also, I was responsible for some, I guess, elements we didn't use, you know. Um, uh, the customer didn't like them. Uh, and also, I think that's about it on my end, really. So sort of one of the other minor challenges we have with the site was just kind of getting it to the style that the client would be content with. Uh, our site has a lot of columns in it, which you can see by the nav bar, we had to make that a column and then the main content section sometimes would have to be made one big column split up into minor ones. So the challenge was kind of getting it stylistically to the client's liking while not cutting out any of the content or making it look strange, you know, once media queries were put into effect. So with each of these pages, we just had to be very mindful of the columns, especially when it came to the projects page, the multiple projects within that page, and the team page as well. So at the end, the client mm -hmm. overall made it pretty clear about what he wanted with that, but I think there we go, side by side. Yeah, initially going in, I thought front end would be probably the easiest task, but I think it was, uh, it was very tedious and time consuming especially um, with what the client wanted in terms of a very minimalistic and simple design. Things we wanted to incorporate, we would spend hours on and then he just kind of didn't want that on his page, um, which was fine. We wanted to deliver whatever the project requirements were, but also what the client wanted and this was the end result. Um, one of the main issues I ran into was uh, when creating the front end, for whatever reason, it wasn't fluid across all of our computers, even though we're all MacBook users. Um, and it took us a long time to figure out, it was just really the columns, um, column usage and percentage. We were using relative, fig or relative units with REM and EM, but it still wasn't working for whatever reason. They were overflowing from the columns. So using percentages worked, uh, but that took us a while to figure out. And, um, 
So we also um, incorporated Firebase, you know, so we ha we'll have like a contact sheet. So if anybody wants to contact them through this page, we'll go into the database. And then it, what we want is for that, um, that information to be emailed to him directly somehow, but that's in the future development of the project. Um, also, we did a lot of, um, we like, uh, what's that called Lightbox, which is pretty cool. So it's kind of like um, its own bootstrap, but that's what makes the pictures um, look more finished when we open the thumbnail. And he really liked that. So that was kind of cool to play with. Uh, I think that's all I have that we worked on. Yes. Uh, on King's page, it was a different type of scroll. You know, yeah, they just switched it. We just wanted more fluidity across the board, like all the pages, and it was just a little. Uh, it was a different carousel, so. Yeah. And there was a lot of back and forth on the text that was displayed. Initially, our client had a few other articles or a few other specific times that wanted to be featured on both the press and the inspiration page. But eventually, you had to just converse with him, tell him the limitations and what looked visually most appealing and most effective in order to reach a compromise and eventually get it to the final. Yeah. Beverly? Did you do an existing site? He did not. Yeah, he kind of had a site that was used for paid service, but it was broken and it was inactive. And if you visited it, it doesn't always respond to the server. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Relevant questions. <laughs> yeah. So, can you show us uh, what you're gonna show when this screen hits? Oh, sure. Do you like the Oh. Right? Yeah, yeah. Hold on. It's not that great. Any other questions? Ooh. All right, well, great job. Guys. That's gonna be the only one. Uh, there it is. All right. Uh, we would like to welcome everybody back to 1995, um, possibly 96. I think Full House is still on the air. Jonathan Taylor Thomas is a huge hit, uh, and this is Vin. Uh, he's a fantastic cat. Um, we started off uh, with this lovely layout that was uh, built solely on HTML. Um, we decided to update it and bring it into the modern era. Uh, I probably should have pulled this up as well. Uh, so we redesigned it, uh, made it bootstrap responsive, and added in some, uh, some nice content so things stack up now. Uh, you can load it on your mobile device. And uh, from there, we added some pages, an About Us page, uh, so that way you can find them and their no-kill shelter uh, program, so that way you can find out what the uh, uh, PetPride.org does. Uh, they are a uh, cat shelter for homeless and stray cats. Um, donation pages, so you could make some donations and uh, help them out. And a mailing list, so that way they are able to get in contact with you, as well as find out who is visiting their website and how they can use that uh, with donors. Uh, and Beverly has some awesome stuff as well. 
Okay, and just to give you some background, some of the things we use, we use balsamic to design it. <clears throat> Bootstrap, Firebase, Heroku, Node, and MailChimp to help bring it to the 21st century. Our main goal was to make it easier for users to navigate the site, to donate money, as well as to su subscribe to newsletters so that the client can remarket. Um, initially, the, the mail opt-in was literally sending an email to the person so they could retype it into Excel or whatever she was using. And by the way, our client kind of went MIA, so we kind of uh, did our best to anticipate what her needs were. Um, again, uh, we use Bootstrap to create the grid system we, and also to utilize existing functionality such as the nav and the carousel. Um, again, as you mentioned, it was a responsive site that could be easily viewed on any uh, screen size. We also integrated the Google API to include maps if you want to go to the About Us so that people can more easily find the location and visit. So you can <laughs> click in here and then get directions to the sanctuary. Um, we also created multiple points of entry for donations for PayPal if you want to go to the PayPal screen. And also included on that. Um, so you guys can click on this now if you don't want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, visit the cats, donate and sponsor, and also the Amazon Smile Lake. And um, Joby can review the back end for the newsletter ops. So, um, so the mailing list page is where we integrated with Firebase. And thanks to Mike, he's a huge help. Uh, we also integrated with MailChimp API to make a mailing list within MailChimp so they can create campaigns for future fundraisers directly in MailChimp and use their data. They don't have to rely on Firebase data to create the mailing list. Uh, and so that was our, my biggest challenge at least, uh, to communicate with the MailChimp API because it wasn't straightforward API call. Um, uh, we, which led us to into this downward spiral of setting up nodes, Node.js, and then and, and impl implementing Express, and then deploying it all to Heroku. So it was a fun little project. And I'm a little happy that we're, it's working today. So. No one. <laughs> Brian. Oh, it's so funny. I actually got a direct mail piece typed out from this uh, you guys, let's section. Pay attention to Beverly. I'm sorry? Let's pay attention to the, uh, Beverly, guys. So anyhow, yeah, I got a direct mail piece from the sanctuary. I volunteer for a lot of cat sanctuaries. That may be that I am. And I could tell, I was like, there's no way this woman has a good website. So I went there and I saw that, that beautiful pink MySpace site. And I was just like, oh, I got to totally reach out to her. And the thing is, right now, there's a lot of sanctuaries that are going to their big donation push. And that's kind of why she went MIA. So we're definitely going to want to follow up with her. There's a lot of things we'd love to implement. And you know, something like this is great because, you know, I love to have the cats. <laughs> David? This one looks great. That's my kitty. <laughs> uh, so that will lead you to a page. Uh, I won't donate $50 from Omar, even though I'm sure he would love to save cats. Um, so it'll lead you to a page where you can sign in. Uh, <laughs> Do not click on one. Uh, <laughs> no, there's like two hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah, if we had more time, we would have integrated the PayPal API. But again, part of that was that it required it required the the uh, owner of the site to have her PayPal information linked to us, so that way we can implement it that way. Uh, and so, unfortunately, we had to kind of uh, jerry rig it, so to speak. They do, PayPal does have a sandbox that you can play in with, um, with uh, like fake accounts. But again, part of the way it was set up, we couldn't mimic that exactly. So we decided to go with this. Well, very well done.
That's the call of the narwhal. I didn't know what they were, so now they're like unicorns at sea. Yeah, oh. that's like the official Reddit animal. Yeah. Uh, all right, who's our next group? Let me see. Uh, let's go to Goofballs. All right, Goofballs. A Goofball? Yeah. Goofball? <laughs> the Goofball normal. Yeah. Goofball normal. <laughs> all right, so our, our website is uh, very similar to uh, who's Brian's website a little bit. Um, we use the Edamom API as well. And uh, we have a, a little bit, a few more pages um, beyond the recipe page. Um, but to start off, there's the recipe page. It uses the Edamom API. So if you want to search for, I don't know, stupid, like chicken. Um, it'll give you a list of the different recipes that you can um, build. Um, I designed it so that you can see how many ingredients it has, how many servings, the name, the link that takes you to, uh, takes you to the website that gives you the, the full um, recipe. And then on the right here on this side, it's kind of a breakdown of the nutritional stats based on the per serving. Um, so it, it includes some equations. Um, the API is pretty good. It gives you servings. It gives you calories, sugar, sodium, fats, um, protein. So I was able to um, use that, manipulate it, and then post it into a table so that the user has an idea of how much they're consuming based on the recipe that they choose to make. Um, additionally, there's a nutritional facts page that when someone inputs a quantity and an extra ingredient in case they want to they know what they're cooking and they just want to know how much they're actually consuming. Um, you can do um, like four ounce chicken. Let's see like two eggs. I'm gonna go crazy, cream of ice cream. And um, this is a different Edamam API. It's a nutritional analysis API. And what it does is that it will grab the quantity and the ingredient that you're searching for, and then it will also spit out this similar nutritional facts, calories, proteins, sodiums, monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, saturated fats, all these like even vitamins and minerals, we just didn't go that deep. And so what this table does is as you're adding these different elements, it'll, um, it'll tabulate the, the total at the bottom. And then the last row is a comparison of the percentage of that item compared to the suggested daily percentages that like you're supposed to consume a day. So like 2000 for calories, it's about 30 grams for sugars, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then once you're done with it, if, you, if the user wants to reset, they can just reset or reload the page and it takes everything out. And then you can start from scratch. Uh, as you can see, this website is about uh, healthy living and lifestyle. So we are into the calories and things and healthy living. So the page I'm working on is uh, going to allow users to search for uh, health clubs and food stores, etc. I didn't do anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's no donation. I think just my enabled it. Yeah, I think it should be coming back up now. Just give it a second. There you go. Uh, here you are. So uh, you sure can uh, come to the web search page to look for locations. And um, this is, by the way, is using Google's map uh, API. And uh, there are different libraries in it. And the library I chose is uh, Praises, which is pretty good. It comes with quite some uh, included uh, functions and uh, methods. Um, the design for us is that we wanted a user-friendly interface. Uh, we want a, a search box on, on the site. User can come into this site to search for business type, uh, such as a gym and near zip code, city, or you can go directly to the exact address. Let me make an example of it. So, 
Here we have uh, one user search for a gym near Dawson Oaks, for example, and uh, we uh, render the results on the map uh, uh, representing with markers. And the markers actually, if you click on the marker, they can show, have a pop-up to show the detailed information of that location. And you sure can, uh, you know, different type of uh, searches. For example, you go, can narrow the search and um, let's say Trader Joe's, um, okay, 91360. So, okay, we have this information and then we are going to say, oh, I would like to see where exactly it is in the location. So we have a pop-up on the marker as well. So um, we have a simple and quick, easy way to go to the driving directions. In the future, we can consider this information to be on the site as well. But for the time being, we're just going to link to uh, Google Map uh, directly. So that's it. So I was in charge of making a forum for people to discuss, um, <laughs> for people to discuss uh, health-related issues or ask questions and get replies. So, for example, someone could put a display name and use my name and ask, uh, uh, "What happens when I drink milk?" <laughs> It'll send a message and you can reply to any of these by pressing the reply button. Um, and by sending a reply, it will dynamically uh, send it into whatever um, message you reply to. That was actually kind of difficult to get it to go into the right place. Um, and even when you refresh, the page, these are still there. Everything saved through Firebase. Um, so the only thing I, future things I would like to do is limit the amount shown and have something to press a button and say, show the last 10 or go older. Right now it just displays all of them. Um, but that was the basic concept of the forum where we were trying to have people be able to discuss facts uh, and opinions health related. How much what? Trouble. Oh, oh man, this is <laughs> <laughs> um if you pay close attention, something works uh at uh, at some point. But somehow, when you integrate, it would interfere. Sometimes it matters whether your map API is uh, on top or in the uh, uh, you know in the head center, or your JavaScript on top. So it matters. It makes it uh, low or not load, and um, it is a different animal because it, it comes with its own functions and methods. You have to figure it out how it works and how to manipulate them. So. It is a lot of trouble. Even up to now, there's a bug there. I don't want to tell you that. Oh, so. Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting. You should uh, repeat the question too. Okay. Yeah, just so for the recording for you guys. Okay, so the question was how, to, how did I get the reply into the right place? That was actually extremely annoying. Um, it was, uh, I ended up using the, the bling operator and then um, for jQuery and then this dot parents until go all the way up. It goes all the way up until the um, last div and then dot, and then that still for some reason doesn't work. And then you have to do dot parent dot find um, and each one of them you have to put in the right, uh, you need IDs for everything, because uh, for some reason classes don't work with it. Uh, but basically it's use parents until, and then parent and find. 
um, until until you figure out what's and the whole way you just uh, console logging every, every time you do like add anything just console log to see where it's at and around where eventually it finds the right place Um, it is very possible to, oh, to, to oh yeah so it, you asked if it allows for user authentication it does not you just you can it has an option to write a display name and we're going on based on people not being bad people <laughs> Never so, happens to the internet, but no. thank you so much. Excellent. Next group. Let's see what the next group is. So, quack. 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 Like three people got that reference. <laughs> we got it. Yeah. Okay. Where is it? Oh. Yeah. So make sure pull that one up. Okay. So. So this was um we got a client um Ali has a friend that has an events planning site so she didn't really give us much guidance she just wanted some in instagram api in there and kind of about all she gave us so this is just her site it's just very plain and white so we uh you know just kind of took our own initiative and changed everything so bring that up this one right here okay so I mean what we did we you know used a push app for the carousel and all that layout and then we implemented Firebase um, just to store visits and we have an Instagram API in there and web API so um, um, yeah so uh, yeah like you said we did bootstrap you can't really see right here uh, with the menu oh, yeah, the yeah, the videos. Oh, you can move that video. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we have all the links um, kind of connected. And right here, this shows your latest uh, photos from Instagram, the latest eight photos. So this is mine right now. Uh, we couldn't get her token, like, but. She didn't give us, she didn't really respond much. So that's why we are still okay. waiting on that. <laughs> yeah. And then Dane, Dane got the, uh, the weather uh, right here, the weather forecast API. And uh, we also have like, you know, uh, email, um, shoot, sorry. Uh, sorry, I don't Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our site's responsive, as you can see. It's, um, uh, sorry, I don't know. I'm messing oh stuff up. What'd you do? <laughs> I don't know. You just opened him everything up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, close that up. It won't. It won't close. Close that up. Um. Yeah. All right. But everything works. Uh, her Pinterest. <laughs> now you went back. Yeah. This is her Pinterest. Oh yeah. Her Pinterest uh, link, yeah. And yeah, her her Instagram. Um. Let's see. And her Facebook and everything like that. Um. So, but that's basically the back end stuff. Uh, for like page visits, we got that too. Yeah, we just have a track in the yeah. visits that yeah, you go on Firebase. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if you want me to. Yeah, and, and speak a little bit louder too. Oh, sorry. Oh. Talking to me. <laughs> or you guys been just talking to the mic too? Um, I did a lot of the styling, like um, created this text and then the colors, and then also included her photo there. And then for this section, um, she wanted these icons from her original website just to show like what she does and the services that she provides. So I created that. Um, they, it was originally created from Bootstrap, so I just replaced it with um, the styling that she wanted using CSS. Um, so yeah, 
that's basically it. All right. Uh, cool. Cool. Yeah, I know. I can't. I can't. Uh, any questions? Is it right? Louis, yeah. Oh, it's right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Louis. Yeah. Um, so when you use the nav bar, uh -huh. you use the edges to like the front one Yeah, to yeah. each section. Yeah. What was that? Is there any different than the fifty or um I mean so, oh, so repeat the question if you don't mind. Oh, okay. Uh, the nav, he's asking about, was the nav bar difficult to implement? I mean, we just have, so we just have our um, IDs for each of the sections and we just had to let, you know, put that into each section to be able to click to the location on the page. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So our next one is slightly asymmetrical. Oh, is it infinite loop? Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. I'm blind. Remember, it's infinite infinite loop. Sorry. The other group was just in red, so it looked like it was kind of it's a good thing about this laptop that if I don't forget what I'm saying, I just did you hate Chuck? Chuck? Boo. Chuck. 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 <laughs> you guys you guys have the link? You got the link? Did you did you slack the link to Ohm? Yes. Uh, uh, or we need to put them out in general. Sorry. Yeah, can you? Oh, don't forget, guys. Tonight, uh, while they're fixing things, uh, so this evening at five pm, I'll be going to Game House, uh, play board games and drink alcohol. Yeah, because so we're using I'll be his joined, computer. I'll be going there. Oh, uh, this is okay. Uh, they do have alcohol. So but yeah, they got alcohol. Uh, yeah, but it's just beers. Uh, we're good. Game House. Game House. Game in, uh, it's uh, H A U S. Uh, it's in Glendale. It's no, it's not German. It's just like. Two nerds who open the store. They're really cool though. Like they're they're friends and they're they're really dope. Uh, so you guys check it out. I hope like everything. Yeah. I'm nerd. Okay. David's really the card to get you back. Anything else you want to show besides the request? You have to open the uh, other uh, uh, you know, you open oh, the another the tooling okay. first so that we can switch it fast. Oh, yeah. so yeah. Only request here, but you have to open the main and the yeah, other. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. That's why I was saying yeah, and then super dope. Like, I'll just walk uh, uh, this one, you can just click me and it's directly. Has it logged in yet? Oh, you, wanted, you don't have to show the Firebase, you can just talk about it. I oh, know, uh, Omar will talk about it. Oh, you want to share? Yeah, we have to log in, I guess. Like the, uh, it's fine. We could we could just talk about about like I don't think we actually have to. Yeah, show it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's to show it. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Do you want to show your link that yeah, you sent? Link to open it back to. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. So, so when you're the request request for yeah. All right. So let you guys. And then when I talk about step. All bugs fixed? Yep. There's only one way to find out, right? All right, let's see. Test it. Test it. All right, everyone try to hack their site now. Sweet. No, don't go to that one. All right.
guys go ahead, Chuck. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Chuck Osmond, product owner for the Infinite Loop Project Group. <laughs> the project that we undertook was for my employer, a local rental property owner. Uh, basically, this is an owner of about 20 different rental properties. The company is, does not have an online presence, none whatsoever. So we undertook the task of implementing an online maintenance request system for tenants. Seeing as this is coming up from the ground up, from scratch, we were given free reign as far as design goes. With that in mind, the most critical component of this application, of course, is going to be the request form itself. Now, we implemented the requisite APIs. We went ahead and also added a feature for maintenance and for future expansion. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and turn over the floor to my colleague, Danny Wynn, who served as our project manager. No, this Which I'll then pivot it over. <laughs> 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 I headed it over to... Uh, Omar. To Omar. And oh, I'm sorry, to Omar <laughs> Our other team member. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This, this application was developed with the tenant in mind. We decided that we wanted something simple, yet sleek and professional, and we decided to emphasize use of use and practicality. We designed a report form with data validation. So if a tenant attempted to fill out and submit the form without proper identifiable information, they would be welcome to a pop-up alert insisting that they fill it out. We have created a drop-down menu that allows the tenant to select um, pre-filled and most common issues associated with the property. Issue. Go ahead. However, we have also implemented the option to select other alongside in the issue dropdown menu. Or if the tenant would insist on describing the specificities of their issue. <laughs> the tenant would then choose their property along with the respective unit number and then be welcomed with the associated property manager's contact information and a map locating uh, where the property is located. And upon um, submission, all of the information gets sent into Firebase and then dynamically displayed on an admin tracking page. An issue that we encountered uh, initially when we were creating the drop down menu was having the idea to future proof it. Because when you click on something and you do it with static HTML, if you were to scale the application larger in the future, you would come across the issue of how would you implement properties if it's a different property manager using it. So we decided to utilize um, H, um, JavaScript in order to dynamically display it. And then for future reference, if and when we scale this application larger, we would be able to implement some type of login credential so a specific property manager can log in and then pre-filled properties that they own and work under would be displayed on. Yes, so now uh, my part is Google APIs. Um, so it is see from the beginning in the Google map and the public metric information do not appear whenever a user click on the property address or the gen address, then the Google map will appear. So what I did with Google Map is I follow three steps. Omar, can you sh uh, show this slide? Um, yeah, so the first step I said two variables, uh, latitude and longitude with initial value of zero. And then in step two, I do a Google Map API to convert the address, the real address, into latitude and longitude value and assign those two values to the first step. And in the final, uh, we, we, uh, we do another API to, uh, to take in the last and long and display it on a map. But the problem we have is that sometimes the step three comes in too fast. Not sometimes, but all of the time they come in too fast. Grab <laughs> <laughs> uh, the use of value. Um, and it shows us some play in South Africa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we make sure that uh, our users are not confused whether they live in South Africa or California. But we have a solution anyway. We take uh, time out, set time out for the step three so that it waits a little until the two value capture the real value from step two. However, another problem is if we make it 
too slow, uh, user may not be happy, or this will be a reset plan. But if we fasten it, the chance of snatching the raw value increases. So yeah, so as you can see, our solution is not complete. So if you guys have any suggestions. Oh yeah, there's a, you can uh, send it to an async inside of uh, the URL actually. Oh. Uh, I can show you guys that later. Yeah. yeah, so that's my part. And now Danny will show you the admin site where property manager uh, can actually update and maintain and manage all the information in our form. And that's Danny. Cool, all right. Um, you guys wanna just click through, I'll just talk through it. <laughs> can you just click through the, the tracker link first? And so, so when we kind of built out this page, we didn't really think about the user experience because it's like no one really cares about the admin stuff. So like when you go to the back office or something, you're just kind of like whatever. So, <laughs> so mainly we kind of what we did was as users are submitting requests, we log an ID, and with the IDs we store all the properties that the user submitted. So they, they selected the address, they selected the issue, um, and we create records in Firebase that that tracks all this stuff. We also added additional things like. Uh, maintain the status and also being able to remove values um, and so the cool thing about this is that you can kind of draw like additional like statistics if you want to so you can see which property is giving you the most issue um, where where the location is you know what type of issue type you're getting like most track you know are you getting a lot of other issues being submitted and do you need to create a new issue type as a result and so um, these data points you can find with how we store the data in firebase um, but from at least a user standpoint, if they don't care about that, um, we did on the top part of the screen, you see uh, we used a plugin for jQuery called like, um, like I don't know, data table, <laughs> data table CDN. And so the cool thing about this is that you can, if you click on the, you click on the uh, issue or phone, uh, that the issue or phone on the top. Oops. Yeah. The left issue or phone. Okay. There we go. So it actually sorts the values that the user um, can you know types in and on, on top of that you type in search and can you type in like Pista? Oh. So you want a uh, Pista? What is that? All the records uh, that we that's within that grid and it looks for anything that has Omar in the name. Um, and on top of that, we also can maintain issue status. And so if you change the issue status here, it actually persists that. So then the nice part is that as you're tracking your issues, you can be like, oh yeah, like I know what the previous state was. I know what the new state is. Um, so that's kind of cool. And then you can remove stuff. Uh, the next thing too that you can do is if you click on any record, uh, so click on like Omar, you can see um, the email, the message that the tenant had but, and so you can be like, dude, where's my car? Okay, this is going on, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, then, and then you have the option to send an email which invokes like this email.js uh, API. And so we had some issues with this one as well at first because there's like, it's, it's, it's client site and a lot of issues that we had were like, was like server. So that basically wrap it up. Wrap it up, my bad. Yeah. All right. So you have to send email, send email works. It's not an ad. So then can you go to the, main, uh, the maintenance? Yeah, please do the add and then. Uh, maintenance screen. Yep, so the maintenance screen, uh, you can add properties uh, and then you can add issues there. So then you can take care of that. So that's basically it. Okay, excellent. Terrence. Yeah, oh, sorry. Michelle. Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> So if you use so, that, oh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. so the, the question was how did we, so in that grid, how were we able to sort and kind of use all those functions in it? So the, the nice part is that if you use that um, that grid, J, uh, J, that grid plugin, it actually contains all the tools for you. So all you have to do is just call it and just and just display the data in that same in the same like list grid format, and then it's able to basically query that entire thing and you can find the value there. And then, Karen, do you have a question? For the issue status, is that only stored in Firebase? Yes. Uh, so, uh, repeat the question. Oh, so for the issue status, is that stored in Firebase? Uh, yes. <laughs> 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 and so, as you update the issue, so 
at first we submit, I think it just submits as a pending request as the default, and then and then the four values, I think that's hard coded in the HTML, but you can flip it one, two, three, four, and then it updates the status. Even I would like to do IDs, but we don't have a table, so I just did my name. Okay. Cool. Excellent work, guys. Was that the eight minute mark on yours? Well, it was actually the 10 minute mark. <laughs> oh, so uh, okay. we really went over. <laughs> yeah, okay. But it was good. It, it was, was good, good, yeah. Ooh. All right, so which team is this next? Us. us. Is that the name of the team? Is us. <laughs> so, so this is slightly asymmetrical. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, we're more than halfway through, and it's only uh, 11. Uh, I need to log into your Slack. Hey, you're Slack. Yeah, there's going to be a bunch of I think it was Did you say Slack? Yeah, there was Slack. 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 Yeah, Oh, uh, I yeah, I think yeah. just took it to the just left and right. Just left and right. You can just click too, I think. Just click here. That's weird. It doesn't show the notes, but that's okay. I got my notes. So I press right left. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hey, what's up, everyone? Hi. Hi. Hey, how's everyone doing? Good. <laughs> All right, so we're uh, slightly asymmetric. I'm Steve-O, this is Chris, Tristan, and Ted. And uh, for our project, we went with a longtime friend of mine. She lives out in Red Lodge, Montana. Uh, she runs a very small company called Ginger Red Naturals. Uh, she is a really kind of neighborly person, focuses on creating organic bath and body products uh, to sell for a local community. And she really wanted a website to showcase her products talk about her passion and find ways to bring the community closer together. Uh, the features that we tried to implement uh, in regards to the project was uh, a blog, a product showcase with an order form, and local news and weather. Uh, in terms of the product showcase, uh, she was really concerned about, she's a pretty small company, uh, she's really worried about uh, expanding too fast. She didn't want to have a store on her site just yet. So we created a product showcase to show off the products and when people express interest in the product, uh, they can go to an order form, which is just a contact form, imports those products into the comment section and then allows her to uh, kind of help her personality build the brand by uh, contacting the clients directly through email. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass this on to Chris who's gonna talk more about uh, some WordPress statistics and things like that and yep. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Uh, allow me to just go over some quick statistics for WordPress. 30% uh, of the top 10, 10 million websites globally will use WordPress. That's from this year. 60.2% of global content management market is run on WordPress. 21.4 uh, billion page views on WordPress blogs each month. Uh, these are some of the things that we did not know, uh, at least I didn't, uh, and through research, thought maybe this was interesting to share with you. So obviously WordPress is the solution that we were gonna go with as our platform, uh, and that's also what the client was using previously. And um, after seeing how extremely useful WordPress can be for so many, our team realized something that would have taken several hours or days to code could be done in mere minutes for projects such as ours. That's how we found ourselves with really nothing to do after work after two days. I lied. There was a lot of problems because thinking it was easy, it was not. Um, you know, I think the saying goes, um, simple, uh, keeping the simplest things are some of the most difficult things to implement. Um, namely, workflow, team wise encoding to, you know, uh, to address the assignment, get repo integration, 
I uh, did not play well with that. It was hard to post. I think some of you uh, alluded to that in your presentations uh, with your projects. Our WordPress themes and technology mainly were the culprits um, we had to use uh, within the sandbox of WordPress. Uh, some of our solutions, we talked to Omar and uh, got, uh, got in touch with uh, an alumni from this program, Chase Olson, uh, understanding PHP a little bit in order for us to, to you know, manipulate things in the back end. And then um, thankfully, we were able to use the Gutenberg editor, which is something new uh, that's going to be coming out for WordPress. We got to play with the beta. Uh, the new plugin, WordPress, uh, helped us out a lot. Um, so basically, what we did was we took WordPress, built the structure on it, and then we were able to take the custom HTML that we had and paste it on there straight on Gu uh, Gutenberg. So that allowed us to take something that's structurally, uh, uh, structurally sound in foundation and then customize the curtains and windows and everything and dress this up through HTML and CSS. And to talk more is Tristan. What's up, guys? <laughs> um, so there was a bunch of issues with this project. Uh, the, the greatest challenge that we had with, with this was uh, trying to make it mobile responsive because she did pretty much everything on her phone. Uh, and she was already using WordPress and WordPress kind of helped us out with uh, responsiveness. Uh, but there was a lot of issues with learning about WordPress. Uh, the first problem we had was the difference between WordPress.com and WordPress.org. Uh, WordPress.org is an open source um, content management system where WordPress.com helps you host the open source co uh, content management system. Uh, we had to figure out some PHP stuff. We had to uh, learn how to implement our JavaScript, and uh, we had to play with like the uh, the MySQL database, uh, my PHP admin. Um, but the greatest oh, but wait, there's more. Uh, <laughs> but the greatest issue we had was the workflow. Um, GitHub wasn't working the way you would think it would because of uh, we believe it's because of PHP not pointing correctly to the correct files. Um, so to fix that, we had to use a combination of things quad programming we all <laughs> programmed on one computer <laughs> um, we use google drive and slack to help uh, keep things together transfer images and code and we also use the plugin called all-in-one migration uh, which helped us clone the entire wordpress file onto each of our computers um, and then big up to Chase Olson. He helped us big time with laying down the foundation and helping us create a path for our project. People were showing us their nearly complete project <laughs> and we were like trying to figure out how to start this thing. It was crazy. <laughs> um, By looking like we knew what we were doing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so WordPress is built on the, uh, the AMP stack which is Apache, uh, MySQL, and PHP. Um, at first, we thought we could just drop the JavaScript files in the WordPress file and everything would work, which is not true. Um, one of the most important files in the WordPress file is uh, called functions.php. Uh, we had to use something called the WordPress and script to set our JavaScript files for inclusion. Um, and that's how our JavaScript files work. Uh, for the last few minutes, I'll show you the uh, website. With, with this Interesting. Oh, uh, go to Slack again. Yeah. Oh. Um, so this is the uh, this is the homepage where she can uh, post blogs. Uh, and this is mobile. Uh, how do I? <laughs> Most of us are PC users. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, mobile responsive. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> We have the uh, product showcase, which displays all the products. Um, what Steve was talking about earlier is that um, instead of using an online shop, we use this feature where the user can add, um, you know, click 
to save the item. Um, and when you go to the order form, um, the item will uh, display in the comment box and uh, it'll, uh, it'll send an email to her after you press send. <laughs> uh, should I do the... Yeah, I didn't use that one. Yeah, well, that's that's what <laughs> Sometimes up. <laughs> <laughs> so we did it. Uh, so, so how did the four? Question. The question yeah. is how how did the four of us code at the same computer? Um, so we did it a couple different ways. We actually crowded around one computer sometimes, and we did like Zoom meetings other times. Uh, but that's how we did quad programming, which we invented. So most <laughs> we're not spooning though. We did a half circle. Half circle. I was going to get to the photos, but our time's up. So. <laughs> um, I was going to ask if the idea to use WordPress solely because that's what the client is comfortable with. Yeah. 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 yeah, that was the main reason why so, we. Uh, we the oh, so, yeah, the, the question was uh, the reason why we used WordPress, and the reason why is because the client used it. And the, the, the client is not super technologically advanced, uh, so she was feeling super comfortable with WordPress and we wanted yeah, we to, wanted to continue that up the top. So the question that when you guys decided to implement WordPress, did you have to change your JavaScript files to integrate with WordPress or there were other files you had to add to integrate with so the question was, when we decided to go with WordPress, um, did we have to integrate the JavaScript files? Did you have to make any changes to your code, or uh, all you needed to do was drag and drop and add some additional files? Um, well, it was, it was like a combination of a couple things. Uh, we had to create our own JavaScript code, and then we had to also um, integrate it into WordPress. So we had to go into the like the root folder of the WordPress's uh, system and tell it to point to our JavaScript files. Otherwise, it wouldn't it wouldn't work. Basically, like the PHP was just like pointers. Um, so it says like, okay, for this page, use this JavaScript file. Thank you. Yep. Yep. That was Excellent. Good. All right. So, uh, what's the net, uh, name of our next group? How I Met Your Code. Um, <laughs> How I Met Your Code. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Clever, clever. Are you guys ever going to say, like, how you met it at the end? Um, we'll say it now. So when we first met, <laughs> um, we bonded over our mutual dislike of The Last Jedi. Yeah. So that's how we came up with our um, app here for movies. And we have an issue with loading unsafe scripts because we have uh, oh, URLs that don't have HTTPS in our code. So um, we used OMDB, uh, New York Times Movie Reviews, and YouTube to bring up a trailer. Um, one of the first issues we had was the OMDB site uh, brings up the last movie or the oldest movie while the other ones bring up the newest. So if I was bringing up A Star is Born, can right link. Uh, is it just taking a walk? No, we're just doing it, like having fun. There you go. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> the first one was bring up the oldest one, the original, and the other ones were bring up the, the newest. So I took the New York Times review and sliced the year and the title and brought it into the other APIs. So it all comes up the same. Um, and the other guys, we'll talk about the other guys. For the for the New York Times API, uh, Lewis and I worked uh, on that part of the project. It was pretty straightforward to get the authorization to use it and then select the uh, 
review, the reviewer, the title, and a link to the actual review page. Yeah, I mean, I wish y'all could draw a code. I mean, how beautiful it is. <laughs> I mean, I have to give it up to my team. Um, we did, when we did our New York Times API, we had to actually do our first because we we're basically setting it up so everything else can kind of fit with that because what other team members were doing was a little bit more complicated. So we, me and Fred finished early. We talked about it, we got it set up. Once we worked with ITA, we figured out how to um, attach the properties to, um, to our um, optic. I mean, it was pretty done for us. So Fred took it home, he actually knocked it out. I was a little shitty, because <laughs> he knocked it out. I wasn't really there for a minute, but we laughed about it, we kept it going. Uh, other than that, I did, I worked on the CSS and um, other stuff, but I'm um, different people. Not shitty for real, by the way. I, everybody looks at me pretty serious. <laughs> so I was joking about this shit. All right. So uh, what I did, I worked on the CSS and to attach a video to the, to the searched movie. Um, so with the CSS, as Liz said, we had like the basic white background and everything, but during class, the first we started on it, we sort of got a foundation and I took it home and what I had to work on was the shaping of everything, the fonts to use, the color contrast was the biggest issue because obviously it's got to look nice to the eye because you're putting text on top of color. And what I love about websites is when they have a night mode, so because it's very easy on the eyes, especially if you're in the dark. So I wanted to go with something with that route. And then another thing I added was uh, an animated search bar. So when you click it, it expands. You search your movie. And then it's attached as a trailer. So the issue I had with the trailer at first, basically I had to use two different get requests from the API. First, I had to grab the ID for the search movie. And then I had to get that ID, sort into a variable. And then in another get request for the YouTube link, I made, it's a YouTube end link. So it's a, you have to add, you have to first put the ID, have it through, go through another API search and grab the file key. I'm sorry, the link key, because every YouTube video has a different key, correct? So you get that and then store that into a variable and have that add to the end of the YouTube end link. And then that's how I present it. Um, and yeah, that's my thing. Next is Will. All right, I'm Will, by the way, for anyone I haven't met yet. Um, so my part in this actually had a few different parts. Um, one, I helped Raj out a little bit with planning the website. Um, I did uh, like data flow charts and stuff like that, just to kind of give the team a, a visual on how we're gonna be processing data, where it's gonna be going, what APIs we're gonna be using, and how it's gonna be going into the, into the uh, database. Um, and then my second part was uh, building the wireframe, um, which the basic HTML was built by me, and these guys kind of went in, fine tweaked it, and added stuff to it as, as, ne as needed. Um, and then finally, I did, I basically was responsible for building the database. So um, basically what I did here was I had to look at it, I had to look at, okay, where's the information coming in first? And it's being entered in by the user in the search menu here. It's then going into, um, it's then being filtered down to the APIs, right? So we had the, uh, we had the three APIs, the OMDB, the New York Times, and the YouTube, right? So from there, um, I needed to identify what did we actually want to store. And um, the original intention was, you see the little user history section over here, um, we, was we were going to have the data come through the APIs, go into the database, and then get filtered into the search history, where it's gonna have some sort of dynamic use where if the user searched 20 different movies and wanted to go back and reference something, he could just click on it, and then it would just repopulate over in the movie details, the uh, New York Times area, and the, um, and the YouTube video. Unfortunately, um, we ran into a lot of complications trying to do that for so uh, with the time that we had. So at this point, what we're doing is we're just showing the search history. But um, in order for me to be able to do that, I had to identify exactly what I wanted to pull out of these APIs. And what we found was originally we were going to we thought we'd store the APIs, and then um, we could go through and. Uh, basically have those APIs channel over it and build and do the movie history. Uh, but what we found out was, is that was making things more complicated. So what we ended up doing was, is we came up with the idea that we'll just use the movie title and the movie year. So what I did, so what I ended up doing on the database, I broke it down into those categories. And uh, so when you see this come over here, um, like the Star Wars, is, uh, the star is born, 
Um, that's basically what's in there, what's being shown on the database right now is movie title and movie history. And um, hopefully we can go back and, uh, and you know, get some time to actually correct that so we can get the full feature in. And I think based off of the information that I did, uh, the research that I've done um, uh, last night, I think what we could probably do is we could probably, using that data, we could probably populate the user history um, to actually be its true function. So that when you, once again, once you click on it, it's going to repopulate, um, you know, a previous search into the uh, response sections. So. And then also uh, at the top left, you see this trending searches. Um, so basically that's also linked to the, uh, the API that I use for the trailer. And what it does is it's subject to change, you know, weekly, every time something gets searched more. So, and then as you saw when the page first loaded, it showed Venom at first. So we had to do, so it's not empty. Oh, yeah. Is it just yeah. displays <laughs> the top trending search on the home, like once you start it up. Yeah. And then, yeah, so that's basically, again, it's an array. The website itself displays, I think the top 20, but you just have to have a for loop and only have it display, you know, however many number you want. So that was. Well, thank you guys so much. Because everyone knows how movies work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Angel and the Tree Huggers. <laughs> All right, so this is a giant freaking group. Uh, and I only allowed it because they had a client that had a lot of things that needed to get done. Uh, so this was like very much an exception. You're going to see like half the class of them right now. Uh, Amari, um, I might have to log you out for a second. Uh, yeah, to log you out. I'll do it. I'll do it, Darren. Well, what should you do right now? That's cool. I'll do it, Darren. Okay. He's, he's logged into Gmail, right? Yeah. So just make sure like go to Gmail. That's yeah, so what I was saying. We should log in. Trust. Trust. Mm -hmm. All right. No, yeah, stop. <laughs> yeah. I want to show that. Uh, yeah. I want to show logging out. Yeah. Yeah. One touch log. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's not even logging out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening, as Omar says. Uh, <laughs> So uh, this is a special project, especially for me. And uh, about a year ago, one of our UCLA alumni and my friend Komal, she went back to India after living here for a few years. And she was shocked uh, by the pollution in her city, uh, shocked enough that she decided to do something about it. Uh, she started a small uh, social group. Uh, the mission of that group is to spread awareness about environment pollution and also organized tree plantation drives. She does something really sweet. She goes to different schools in villages and uh, assigns one tree to every student. They have to plant it and take care of that tree. So it, I, I was really, uh, I, I follow her on social media and I was really inspired and impressed by her work. Last time when I visited India uh, early this year, I had a chance to meet with her and I asked her, how can I help you in this? And uh, one thing that came up was she still didn't have a very big online presence because she didn't have a web website. So we started with that idea to just have a website to tell people what she is doing. And uh, since then, the idea of this website came along and it grew a lot. We have added a lot of features. I'm talking about the idea right now. Um, but then I joined this boot camp uh, and I met all these wonderful people and uh, I'm telling you this, I have seen that idea grow, I have seen that idea grow from an idea to a reality now. Uh, it's still not done, there is a lot we have to do, but none of that would have been possible without the help of these guys. Uh, they were an amazing team, we coordinated so well, uh, and I think we learned a lot. Uh, Jake is going to start with our homepage. Uh, um, so I took care of a lot of the front end stuff. Um, we uh, use Bootstrap for a lot of the layout. Um, as you can see, everything is uh, mobile, designed mobile first, so everything is uh, super responsive on every page. Um, I also paired up with Herman to 
work on some of the cool stuff that he is about to show you right now. Uh, okay, so um, one of the uh, main problems that we needed to solve was uh, we were designing it for four types of users. So uh, we wanted to design it for a user that just came to the website and wanted to register for an event uh, just using their name and email and didn't want, <laughs> excuse me, didn't want any part uh, to do with uh, logging in or anything like that. Uh, so the second one was to uh, actually have a user go in and create a profile so that way they can keep track of all of their events. And then the third one was an admin user and fourth was just a master admin that can basically modify most of the, uh, the content on the site. Um, so for, uh, for login, we used uh, Firebase uh, Auth and Firebase UI to be able to log in using uh, an email and also the, uh, the Gmail integration. Um, so you can, uh, so the, uh, the Google login um, supports just one touch login. So if Omar was logged into Gmail, it would just automatically uh, sign him in. Uh, but because he's, not a, because he's not an admin in our site, I'll just use my Gmail. Um, so that way uh, we can display some other functionality. Okay, so there we're, uh, we're authenticating, and we're also, uh, so I'm already uh, a user, um, so it doesn't create a, a brand new user, and we'll have some other features that we'll talk about uh, with that functionality. But now you can see that uh, this is using my Gmail picture, um, and then also, um, so you can log out and then log back in. Um, and one of the other things that I worked on was uh, setting up the uh, Firebase uh, uh, structure. Um, so we wanted to flatten out the, uh, the database so that way we can perform quick queries. Um, so we have uh, certain objects for uh, events, um, we have for attendees, uh, dates, and then also for users. So what you can do is you can quickly query for uh, all of the events that a user is registered for or all of the, um, the events that are coming up in a certain date and then also all of the, uh, the um, events that, or the, the users that are registered to a particular event. So you can go uh, backwards with that. Um, and so with that, uh, now Lynn can talk about some of the calendar features that we have. So we wanted a way to uh, display all of the upcoming events. Um, and at first we thought we could use um, Google Calendar API. Um, they have some UI toolkits and um, we played with it and we weren't happy with how it looked. It looked kind of old fashioned and out of date. So we searched for another JavaScript library and we found one called Full Calendar JS and we were pretty happy with it. So you just load an array of events from the database and you feed it to the, um, the JavaScript library and then it can paint this calendar. It can display it in week, day, or list mode. And um, you can hover over an event to find out a little more information about it. Um, and then if you want to register for an event, you can click on it and we have a modal that comes up that says the time, description, the location. And then since um, we're already logged in here, it um, knows who you are and you can just register for the event and say whether or not you want an email reminder. If you aren't logged in, you can... Um, It'll show an email and uh, name field, and you just enter your email and name. You can register for the event without creating an account on site, because a lot of people aren't comfortable with creating an account. Um, and then it saves your attendance, you know, your RSVP for that event. Uh, so a lot of what I worked on, uh, I helped with the calendar and I especially worked on um, the admin controls because, uh, you know, the people who work for the foundation, they need to be able to add events or edit the events, but we don't want to give them like access to the database itself. Um, so we have a form that opens up if you're signed on, if you're signed in as an admin account. And it allows you to input all the information, so title, description, the date and time, and then you can use the uh, Google Maps API to search an address, and then it'll find the location. So then when you add the event, it'll save the uh, location ID as well as all the other information. Um, so then when you go and view the event, it has all the stuff displayed. 
Uh, and then to edit the event, it just pulls up the same form, but it's already populated. And so you can change whatever information you need to. Um, and then if you, whatever information you change, uh, the, it goes through immediately. So if I change this date to the day before, then on the calendar, it moves the day forward. So, um, and then if we weren't signed in as an admin, then these buttons wouldn't show up. So you just can't do that. Log out, log out. Oh yeah, okay. Just the yeah, so, yeah, so there's no add button and then there's no edit button anymore. And then you can see here at the sign up. I worked on a donation page, um, which has a, you know, placeholders of money and then you can input your own value, like for whatnot, then write a comment saying whatever you want to say. And you could also put it for a monthly payment or a one-time payment. So just let me go next. You enter your, you enter your information. You enter your information. <laughs> oh no! Nothing's going. Nothing's been out there. Nothing. Nothing will go through. So you could either do PayPal or you could either change it to uh, using your card. It's right. also currently linked up to Brian's PayPal. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so um, yeah, that's kind of the donation page. <laughs> Uh, so me and Webb have worked on the um, mostly APIs. We initially worked on the Maps API and Calendar API, but later Angel and Lynn took over to fix the UI. So then our main focus began uh, became um, working on the email impl implementation. So a feature we wanted users to have was to receive an email for when they register and a reminder email uh, 24 hours before an event that they registered. So what we did was we linked the email, or sorry, we linked um, our send email function to the user authorization. So every time a new user was created in the system, it would send them a welcome email. And then we created a separate function for sending reminder emails um, to send them emails 24 hours beforehand. And we made sure to grab their name um, and the time of event from the database. Um, and we started with the, using Gmail API, but we realized there were a lot of limitations. Uh, so there were, they only let you uh, CC 10 people and we want to be able to send mass emails depending on how big the events are. And so for our client, we didn't want to have any limitations. Um, so we decided to use Peppy Post, which was free and allowed for 12,000 emails a month. And WebHop can talk more about it since, uh, about the trigger functions that we use. So, um, so I, as the, uh, he mentioned that we are basically triggering two types of automatic emails. One is for welcome email and one is a notification email. So uh, this was, we wanted all this stuff to happen in the cloud itself. And we wanted to grab all the information from Firebase database. So what we did was we used the Firebase trigger functions. And uh, something interesting we found out about Firebase was that they do not have a time-based trigger function. All their trigger functions are like event-based. So we had to create our own sort of hacker way through creating own time-based trigger function. We created a pre-trigger function in our JavaScript that changes a value in the Firebase database, which triggers that function. So that was really cool to work on. Like it took us a long time and once we did it, we were super happy. Uh, that's pretty much all about our website. Uh, I like to end it uh, by saying that how uh, wonderful it is that uh, Nobody needs to wait uh, even a single moment to start improving the world. It's a quote by Annie Frank, and uh, I think uh, it tells a lot. Thank you, guys. Right. So, uh, oh, and let's repeat the question. Sure. sure. So uh, the question is that uh, do does Peppy Post provide us with the domain, or we need our own domain to send those emails? And uh, I believe he's talking about the email domain, like not not like the website domain, but uh, for example, at the rate rickshaw.com. By the way, uh, it's the name of our site is rickshaw.com. Uh, uh, so yeah. Uh, Peppy Post has this feature where uh, sandbox feature where you can go and test their product. So they provide you with a temporary uh, domain that you can use to send emails and test. Uh, 
you, we do need our own sending domain, which we add to Peppy Post, they authenticate it, and then it works. The, for anyone who's looking for something like this, I would highly suggest using Peppy Post because uh, as far as I research, Peppy Post gives us 30,000 emails free every month, uh, which is more than any I have seen. So, yeah. Any more questions? Oh, all right. Well, that's it. <laughs> All right, so do we have any more groups? Yeah. Yeah. No more? Oh. <laughs> All right, so uh, we have at at. So after at, at we have pocket monsters and then is that it or is there another group? Okay, so that at and then pocket monsters. Cool. Pocket monsters. <laughs> Maybe just download it. <laughs> I have a PowerPoint on screen. This video. Yeah. Oh, then you can just, yeah, just double click on the right hand side. Um, right go on the right hand side. It's right hand side. Right, right hand side. side. Oh, <laughs> like, uh, click X. Right. And on the right hand side. Oh. Uh, right. Yes. And then double click that. There you go. Yay. <laughs> and then they can pull. Okay. Are we ready to go? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is our website, um, Saver. We initially had a whole different concept we were trying to do. And when we started implementing the Google Places API, because we couldn't use Yelp, uh, we ran into some problems with um, targeting different information in the API. So then we had to change our entire idea. So we started with a restaurant finding website where you would initially search for the type of food that you want and then on the page it would display the top and the worst restaurants in your area, but that didn't work. So then we targeted the API through the price range, which is why we went to Saver and why you're gonna see some dollar signs everywhere. So now when you search for a type of food, it's going to display the best restaurants in each uh, price range, depending on how much you want to spend. Um, go ahead. Okay. Hello. Um, so about Saver. So um, like we said before, it allows you to search like the restaurant that you want near you. So you put in your address in like the little box and then it'll tell you all the names of the restaurants within like what price you want it do um so yes, yes. and <laughs> yes so, like basically there's a four steps on our system it's the uh, first is the landing page and second is about about the our website and third is search results and last is user recommendation so we, our first page looks like this you can put uh, like italian japanese or like uh, the genre of the food and a uh, second field is you can put any addresses out of field So it's about the website um, Okay, one more thing So the reason we called it saver is so that you can like it was a funny little thing like so you can save money if you want or not so Yeah, saver or, or not <laughs> yeah, So it's, this is the third page result result uh, search results so it's uh, based on the uh, like uh, the category of the price range you see the rating and address and name of the restaurant and last one we use firebase so uh, a user can put their recommendation and the 
most recent uh, recommendations so shows up on the right. And tech technologies we use is Bootstrap, Google Places API, and Unsplash API, and Firebase. Do you want to talk about Unsplash? Yes. Um, Unsplash is the API we use to display the images to the carousel on the website. Um, it's just basically an image library, and that's the second API. Yeah. So um, uh, I use Google Places to find the restaurant near. Uh, based on the user input. Uh, I have problem with the Google Places because um, every time uh, the in order to work the website, I need to allow um, cross-origin resource sharing. Uh, I can show you later. So uh, also I use two Google Place API first. I use a Google Places to find the geocode for the user input. And later with that geocode, I found the um, uh, restaurant object. And later I just uh, coding to uh, separate by the price range and append to the website. Uh, future development, um, I want to put uh, pictures, uh, like uh, like the each pictures from the restaurant that I've with the user input and also, um, Let's see if our website is working. <laughs> so I, I don't know if you can see this, but you know this icon. So this has to be enabled in order to be uh, uh, the Google Places to be worked. So and that's just a local. Uh, you guys are not going to be running into this when we start getting into uh, Project Two. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, so it's, oh, if you search it, as um, this uh, the result comes out, and if you want to re on uh, do the new search, it just uh, goes up to the top and refresh the page, and then like you can um, just send an image. And submit, and it will sh uh, show on the right. And that's it. We did, and that didn't work. It's not going to work for project one because of yeah. the LPAPI limits that go off. I mean, that you have to have a service. With one of our APIs, though, we kind of, like it didn't work completely, but the carousel one connected everything, but that doesn't make sense. Okay. That's Any other questions? Well, that's your job. All right, last group. You broke off your computer. Yeah. Uh, it's mine now. <laughs> Wait, where is this computer? That's not, that's not mine. Oh, I thought uh, it was his. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was his. I was like, wait. I <laughs> donated $797, lost your computer. And then apparently donated to a bunch of cats, too. Ah, <laughs> uh, I guess so. Uh, inadvertently, yeah. All right, pocket monsters. Yeah, we're, we're now called cool forever and complete. Yeah, you guys are always missing one member. It's Every single time. I don't know where our group leader is. Where's Stevie? Is he alive? Uh, we, we slacked him, like, but he didn't like, respond. Like, like, I, okay. like, I mean, a tree did fall in his house like last week. It did. A tree literally fell in uh, Stevie's place yeah. last week. Yeah. Uh, Maybe There's another tree fell in his house. Yeah. The I'm second tree got him. Right? The second uh, tree got him. A second tree finished the bottom? The first tree was just, it, it was just a pond. Oh, we're doing it on this. Are we doing it on this one or this one? Fine print along along the left side. It's probably gonna be up on this yeah. somewhere up here. You're probably gonna have to scroll up. Do, yeah. Do not click on the link yet. Okay. Do not click okay. on it. Okay. All right. There it is. Are we ready to go? All right. Yeah.
when you guys are ready. All right. Good evening, everyone. Our group is forever incomplete. <laughs> so my name is Grant. I would, I'm, I'm a UCLA fourth year math major for the better, for the worse. Um, I was the, the person who created the, the model for the website. Oh. Oh. And <laughs> yes, yes, introduce yourselves, please. Hi, I, I don't know that's what we were doing. Hi, my name is Ryan. Um, the website was originally my idea. I wanted to create something related to space, so I came up with the idea of the solar system model, and that's how we ended up with. Uh, Graham was able to implement uh, basically all what I wanted, so props to him for that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and don't be like intimidated by the stuff you guys see. Like, uh, Ryan has an astrophysics. No, be intimidated. Group. Yeah. It was, it was so <laughs> impressive. Like, yeah. uh, I didn't. And then, then Grant has that math major. Yeah. And, uh, and he also has some like, major skills too. And it's he yeah. also like, some major skills. Yeah. yeah. So this was a. Uh, this is gonna be our solar system simulation. Oh, I'm Eddie, by the way. Uh, I primarily worked on the front end implementation, uh, creating indexes, and basically the wireframe for whatever these guys needed, including tables and stuff that they could just use all the functionality in. Uh, so we're gonna go in and open this guy. Oh, and Stevie, who's not here, he was our project manager. Uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, the tree, the tree fought back party this time. Also, got so offended by by the issue we had last night and the mess that was created, but it's resolved now. Yeah, we had a major catastrophic issue. Long story short, I was sort of messing with his branch to try to fix things and make things worse, but then everything's fixed now. His branch might be in corrupted, but the, 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 the master is not. So, side, <laughs> aside. Anyways, all right. So, when right, so we finally go into the website, I would like to mention that, that originally, like, we were attempting to seek out clients from among these uh, like, faculty. So, what happened was, like, I knew one person in the physics department who knew another person who knew another person who knew another, another person. But unfortunately, after all the email changes, it didn't fall through. And so rather than, than trying to scramble to pander to what employers want to see, we decided to just go with their passion. So, yeah, space it is. Yeah, yeah. we've had the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, we did actually start working on this until 10 days ago. Yeah, so don't, please don't judge. Okay. All right, here go we go. Eddie. So this is going to be our homepage. Um, it pretty much displays all the planets, including the inner, the dwarf, and the outer. Um, these guys are going to talk more about the functionality and what they had to go through JavaScript-wise. Uh, we have the fate of the sun page, which Ran is going to show you the function of. We also have a data page here, where Ryan showed all these graphs and plots. I have no idea what these are. <laughs> it's just like it's just a lot of math. Yeah, it's uh, it's very complicated. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, we have some uh, coordinates page here, as Ryan made also. This is going to give you the relative latitude and longitude of the planets uh, relative to your absolute location. So if you were to implement or input your latitude and longitude here, it would give you all of the like 132. Uh, 1,000. 1,000 is too much. Uh, yeah, okay. So it'll tell you where Mar Mercury, Venus, Mars are relative your, to your location. And then we also added a NASA API here, which is for nerds of all ages. <laughs> More fun stuff. So just images. And then, uh, did you want to go and explain your page? Yeah, all right. Let's go back to, to the main event. So let me just, can someone dim the lights? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, super nerdy. All right, the, dang it, there's no scroll bar. Okay, that's fine. All right, so as, as you can see here, it's right, right here, we have just a nice typical model of the eight planets plus, plus series between Mars and Jupiter. That's one of the dwarf planets, by the way. It might be hard to see up there, but there is, in fact, a navy blue ring colored in to represent the location of the asteroid belt. It should be noted that the relative speeds of the planets are accurate, but the sizes and distances are not whatsoever. So, <laughs> so this is just model number one. Let's go to model number two, the inner planets. Yeah, I have a quick plug-in. 
So Ceres is the uh, largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. It's also a gold planet. It got promoted to a gold planet in the planet system. Wait, are you talking to the mic? Okay. So Ceres is uh, the largest uh, the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. It counts for a, a third of the total mass of the asteroid belt. It's also a dwarf planet. <laughs> All right, so here's the inner planets. No, you guys are not high. The sun is moving in a circle in the middle. This is here to represent that the sun is not actually stationary as the planets go around, but it actually goes around a barycenter due to the gravities of the other planets, especially Jupiter. The barycenter happens to fly outside the sun's radius. That's why it's doing that. So don't worry, everything's fine. So, um, yeah. So. I'm, I'm, I'm good, you can go. So on, on average, the bear center of the solar system lies about 7% of the sun's radius outside the sun, primarily due to the influence, primarily due to the influence of the um, gravity of the gas giants and most of the Jupiter. Um, yeah, so on average, the sun actually does orbit the bear center as does, as does all the bodies in the solar system, not, not actually the sun itself. Also, talk a little bit slower. I think you're like really excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just really anxious and nervous. I don't want to hear the blasted music. All right, maybe you're thinking about time. Yeah. 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 All right, yeah. and finally to the to the dwarf planets. So as you can see, this shows everything from Neptune and beyond. Like like, no, you guys aren't high. Pluto and and Charon oh, Ch Charon <laughs> are like they're, Pluto isn't like coasting along its elliptical orbit neatly, it's actually sort of jiggling a little. This is to represent that due to the size of Charon, actually the bare center for that whole two body system lies close to Pluto's surface, but not in center. So that's why there's that. Also characteristic of Pluto, if you look really closely, you can see that the orbit does indeed cross, uh, slide past Neptune at certain points, though the orbit isn't small enough for it to slide past Uranus. So, <laughs> so, <Uranus>. so <laughs> all right. It's pronounced Uranus, by the way. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so this huge purple band, which might be hard to see, this represents the Kuiper Belt. It it lies a bit past Neptune, and then finally this 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 outwards um a uh, slate grayish area. This represents the Oort cloud at the very, very, very periphery of the universe. Mm -hmm. All right. So you can switch seamlessly and you can even pause at any moment and even like switch while paused and then unpause like, like I thought about all this, don't worry. <laughs> Just to add on the uh, Pluto Charon system, uh, Pluto and Charon are actually highly locked to each other. So Charon isn't just a moon, um, it heavily influenced uh, Pluto. So that's why they're shown as a two-body system. Um, so you want to go over the sink? Um, we can go you over want that. To save that for the end? Yeah, we'll go okay. over that sink that later. Yeah. The Oort cloud is uh, the origin of most of the comets. The Oort cloud is about one light year in uh, radius. It's, it's a large sphere of comets that basically surrounds the solar system. It goes out very far. And the Kuiper Belt has a lot of interesting objects, such as all the dwarf plants you see on this page. Um, yeah, the Kuiper Belt is the home to most of the dwarf planets. You see Haumea and Makemake and several other candidates out there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, nerdy stuff. <laughs> do you want to go to the graph page? Yeah, you gotta go to the nerdy stuff. <laughs> okay. This is your time to shine. Okay. So the first graph uh, shows the uh, relative distances of the planets and dwarf planets relative to. Uh, relative to the center of the solar system on average. And the y-axis shows their inclination. So like the inclination of the orbit and how, uh, how tilted they are relative to the center of the solar system. Uh, as you can see, the dwarf planets have really tilted orbits. Is one, of the, one of the reasons why they're classified as dwarf planets is because within their orbit, they're not really independent, independent and heavily influenced by mostly the, uh, the orbit of Neptune. What do you mean by tilt? So this is the uh, uh, orbital plane of the solar system. Uh, their inclination, for example, uh, Earth's inclination is like this. It's really, it's really tilted. Whereas, like Earth is like oh, okay. like that. This is the relative mass of the planets. As you can see, Jupiter dominates the mass of the solar system of the of the planets. Jupiter's mass is more than uh, twenty or fifty percent of the combined mass of all other planets, and it's primarily due to Jupiter that the bare center of the solar system lies outside the sun. So 
So here, show, here shows the um, brightness of the objects in the solar system. Um, so apparent magnitude is how bright an object appears to us from our point of view on Earth. And absolute magnitude is the uh, inherent brightness of the object. So for historical reasons, and because astronomers are weird, the more negative the number, the brighter the object is. So the sun has a value of negative 26 for its absolute magnitude. It's really bright. And the next brightest objects in the sky are the, uh, the full moon, Venus, Mars, and Jupiter. Those are pretty much visible whenever they're up in the sky. And for comparison, I have the absolute magnitude of several stars here. Um, Betelgeuse is a really large uh, red hypergiant star. Uh, it has an absolute magnitude of negative 5.85. It's really far, but we're able to see it really bright in the sky, in the sky because it's very inherently bright. And Alpha Centauri here is the closest star to us aside from the sun. You said there's aliens there, right? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> you said there's aliens there, right? <laughs> oh yeah, two years ago, the discovery of an Earth-like planet around Proxima Centauri is very interesting uh, because it's really close to us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, before I go over this graph, do you want to go to the Red Giants page? But, but I can't explain this graph. Yeah, I don't think we should have the entire. But this is this is the point. You fine, just don't click on the button. Do it. Yeah, just finish it up. Okay. Wrap it up. Okay. So this shows the evolution of the sun um, across time, and so this is uh, present age. Yeah. So it's supposed to be red. We haven't implemented that, but eventually the sun will blow up to be a red giant and swallow up uh, Mercury and Venus. And when it does it the second time, it also swallow up Earth. Um, so that that happens about. Uh, <laughs> Four days. <laughs> Four days, right? Four days. Right? <laughs> 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 That will happen about uh, like seven billion years from now, so it's nothing we have to worry about. Uh, but eventually the sun will remain as a tiny white dwarf the size of Earth at the center. Uh, good question. That's uh, so, uh, repeat the question. So uh, you're asking uh, when the sun implodes, where is it? I, I heard that somewhere. I was wondering that, that was, that was, that was, that so so the origin of the white dwarfs and black holes. Yeah, good question. So um, how the fate of a star depends on its initial parameters. So for stars that begin with at least eight solar masses they will die as either a neutron star or a black hole. For a star the mass of our sun, it will end up as a white dwarf because uh, its core density and temperature isn't high enough to ignite fusion of the higher elements. The most massive stars will fuse elements in its core all the way up to iron, so, iron, so they have a plasma iron core at the end of their lifetime. And that, the density of that is so high that um, like regular types of pressure aren't, support, aren't able to support the inward gravitational collapse. So neutron star is the most dense thing in the universe, uh, aside from black holes. Uh, it's the size of a city uh, and has more mass than the sun. And if even neutron degeneracy pressure, which is the pressure that supports a neutron star, cannot hold the gra uh, inward gravity, then it collapses inward to a black hole. But that only happens to stars with at least in this eight initial solar masses, so much more massive than the sun. Our sun went up with a white dwarf. So we're not going to start here. Um, <laughs> several people who have, like, Weird questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I, I see your hand. You guys, let's, let's, give, let's give a JavaScript question. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, sure. It's copyrighted. Uh, who has a hand up next? Well, I, think, I think Chuck had it up first, and then we can go to. Okay, I'll just go uh, to you. Mine's kind of a dirty question. First and foremost, it's a very impressive simulator. Could you guys do sort of a 3D upgrade on this thing where you can show orbital patterns, say like a Keplerian orbit, where you can map a specific percentage of the surface, say from the satellite, because I saw that you were showing Chiron as well as the Earth's moon. Really interesting stuff. Chuck used to work at JPL, I think that's right. 
Oh. Oh, really cool. That's just something I remember. I thought, wow, that was really cool to see that, where the satellite, you can actually see the orbital pattern of the satellite. This was something that was used on a man made satellite. It was a Matt Venus. So that's pretty cool. I actually plan to implement something uh, showing the orbital patterns over time <laughs> because over time all the orbits are actually not ellipses. They're more like roses. They form a rose shape. But that took way too much math and my math was wrong so I wasn't able to implement that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think Grant has some ideas on making a 3D model. So my idea is that, that rather than going through all the issues of like taking 3D engine, I would just I would just be really careful about Z indexes so that planets would be behind other planets and they just squash everything down. So it's very, very possible, but, but do I really want to? And not right now. So I think Omar had a question. Uh, did you guys include any like multivariable calculus or like physics equations in to make it work? No, we, only, uh, we implemented so some. Uh, the question was that do we include some higher level math such as multivariable calculus? No. Um, if you want to be really accurate, you should though. But I, like for the coordinates, um, I actually excluded a lot of the perturbation factors such as like the proximity to Earth where precession or mutation. So it's, it's accurate within a degree. But if I want to be really accurate, we would include a lot more math in it. But actually, I uh, just like integrated some open source code and adjusted that uh, for my personal code to implement this function. So it's just a lot, a lot of coordinate transformation. Uh, could you repeat that, please? So the question is how 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 did you guys make the movement of all the planets that were forming uh, relative to each other? And let's repeat the question. That's going to be. Uh, how did uh, how, we how make the, the movement of the of the planets uh, done in JavaScript? Okay, I think Grant should answer that. All right, let's let's see the pretty thing one more time. Let's repeat the question uh, for, for your guys' video. All right, okay. so the question is, how did we get the planets to move uh, properly relative to each other? All right, so I don't know if you're talking about time scale or trajectory. Uh, all right, all right, okay. Let's start with trajectory. Okay, first off, okay, first off, these circles are just circles. You don't need to know anything fancy. All you have to do is know how to how to deal with polar coordinates, and making a circle is easy on. Speaking of this, this rectangle actually does not use a single bit of CSS except to position it in the center of the screen. Like, this is an HTML canvas element. It's an element that lets you have pixel perfect drawings, which makes it great for games and animation. So I just use the JavaScript to program what are essentially equations of circles to make them go in circles. And then something similar for ellipses for dwarf plans. So that's how to get the trajectories for this thing. As for how we get the relative speeds, so what happens is that, that, that every single frame one Earth day passes. So, so I just have an object with all the planets. So if you just put in the number of Earth days that it takes for each revolution, then, then uh, assuming the rest of the code is implemented correctly, everything will seamlessly move as fast or as slow as you want it to move. Right, so I think that's it for questions. So, uh, there's like so many more people asking questions. Uh, so, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Woo! <laughs> 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 just uh, talk to the person or slack them. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, yeah. Um, wait, wait, wait. Um, Euphora is, is the way to go. Just take one thing and then you need a model. Before is where you put the code in. Oh, really? Yeah, there's a CSS function. There's an advanced CSS method where you can take one shot. Okay, all right. We're going to show one more thing, I guess. Can we do something before we die? Yeah, go back to the website, Ryan. You can show this later. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, everybody, I, I, I slacked something under Saturday class. It should be the link to the, to the website. Please make, tell, like, make sure I didn't accidentally slack like, to an anime music video or something. Okay, so, so you might have noticed that we didn't quite go over this weird sync looking button up here, right? So everyone, I want you to open the GitHub link and please head to the front page with the 8Planet model. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if this actually this works. Just let me check the first. Yes, 
All right, okay, okay. So, so if all goes well, then I think I'm going to die. No, <laughs> you're not going to die. So, so basically, what explode. happens is that is that CV incorporates Firebase so that so that if you wanted to, you could have your plant sync up with the guy who's in the Firebase. So, I mean, since since Firebase is not instantaneous, your plants might be behind by a little bit, but but that's the idea. So I don't know. I don't know how well it's working right now because we never tried with this many computers. We only tried like twenty tabs open at the same time. But but that's what the idea was. And so you can try it right now with Jeff here or with your neighbor to see if you can get the sync up. But we have had some tests with them, so that's that. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> well, well, thank you. All right. So let's wrap it up. Good work, guys. So um, give yourselves a round of applause for finishing. Like, holy shit. And I always say this, it's really rare to get every single project finished. All of you guys are able to finish your projects. Um, usually it's like one or two projects, I'll be like, ah, uh, we didn't finish. But you guys were all able to present and you guys were all able to show something. So that, that really shows a lot. Uh, so we're going to get out early. Uh, hope you guys get some time to relax. Uh, if you guys feel like hanging out at Game House today, do that. Otherwise, if you guys feel like drinking together, relax, or maybe bring... There's a weed store a couple of blocks away. <laughs> that way, actually. So you guys... It's legal now. There's a marijuana store to buy some marijuana. There's also a Canadian government that will teach you all you need to know about rolling toys. Oh. Uh. <laughs>